Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome uh, to the July instalment of the New Books Seminar here at McCall, Macquarie University. Uh, it's a very special event for us today because we have not one but two uh, authors to meet and, uh, and hear from. Um, but to begin with, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Macquarie University land, the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. And now I'd like to hand over to my esteemed colleague, uh, Associate Professor Kate Rosmanith, and she will introduce you to today's speakers. And um, over to you, Kate. Uh, Daniel Johnson is the author of Phenomenology for Actors that we're discussing today, um, as well as the author of Theatre and Phenomenology Manual Philosophy. He's an honorary associate at the Department of Theatre and Performance Studies at the University of Sydney, and also the Research Partnerships Manager for the Faculty of Arts here at Macquarie. He's also an honorary virtual fellow with the ARC Centre of Excellence for the History of Emotions. Previously, he was a principal lecturer at Sheffield Hallam University, UK, and also lectured at the University of Notre Dame, Australia, the University of Sydney, the National Institute of Dramatic Art, and Macquarie Uni in Cultural Studies. He holds a PhD in Performance Studies from the University of Sydney and an, a and an MA in Philosophy from the University of Cambridge. So um, Lisa Marie, Dan and I share a history. We all completed postgraduate degrees in the Department of uh, Performance Studies at the University of Sydney and we've known one another for a very long time, uh, which makes today sort of doubly lovely, actually. It's really lovely to have this reunion here. Um, so I wanted to begin by asking you both to speak to us a little bit about the genesis of your books. So for those people um, who are listening today who may not have um, sort of read the pricey of each of the books, I'm just going to read read them out. Um, so first of all, so Lisa Marie's um, book is an intimate transnational and transcultural study that investigates the theatre making practices of Indigenous women playwrights from Australia, Aotearoa and Turtle Island. It offers a new perspective in performance studies employing an Indigenous standpoint specifically an Indigenous woman's standpoint to privilege the practices and knowledges of Maori, First Nations and Aboriginal women playwrights. And it's written in the style of ethnographic narrative. So Lisa Marie, um, how did the idea for your book develop? Um, did you always know what the book's focus would be? No. <laughs> um, I guess it came out of doing the, the um, performance studies program. Mm. at UCED and the kind of when we were there the focus was on rehearsal studies we all we all did rehearsal studies um, which was I thought was really amazing and I just was thinking at the time no one has ever sat in a room with indigenous theatre makers um, and that there's a lot of reasons for that and we may get to that a little bit later in the discussion but I just thought it was perfect timing really to to take that those approaches to the study of Indigenous theatre more broadly. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dan, um, so Dan's book gives new insight into acting and theatre making through phenomenology, the study of how the world shows itself to conscious experience. It examines being in the world in everyday life with exercises for workshops and rehearsal. Each chapter explores themes to guide the creative process through objects, bodies, spaces, being with others, time, history, freedom and authenticity. The book makes a bold leap to understand acting as an embodied form of philosophy and to explain how phenomenology can be a rich source of inspiration for actors, directors, designers and the creative process of theatre making. So how did the idea for your book develop? Because mm, mm. <laughs> I think both the books are unique. I think mm. this is unique like and I'll ask about the structure later but I think um, yeah how did how did it develop and how also mm. how'd you get it published like the ah. the pitch for it <laughs> like I was quite curious about that <laughs> that's that's a while back um, so like Lise Marie um, I think the influence from performance studies it's now theatre and performance studies it's interesting that they've rebranded themselves yeah um, so I was teaching, I actually, that was my first teaching gig, was taking tutorials in the first year unit, and it was called Being There. Um, and 
we taught that unit with a, a four different pillars of analysis, right? And, you know, so obviously semiotics was there, ethnography, anthropology, you know, history. Um, but phenomenology was there as one. And I guess this, the practical oriented um, element of this book sort of came from that tutoring. Um, so I ran it less as a sit down and let's discuss the readings for today and more of let's get up on our feet and try some things out. Um, so my, my first book was pretty much a, a rewrite of my PhD, which was looking at 20th century approaches to acting as phenomenological investigations, right? And it was a little bit clunky, but that was sort of pitched as an introduction to theatre and phenomenology with a pretentious title, Manual Philosophy. Um, and then, so this is sort of taking that a little bit more forward and trying to find uh, practical ways for people, theatre makers, I guess, to approach their process using a philosophical lens. And um, <clears throat> phenomenology itself is quite... a you know, a mouthful of a word there. And so it's nice in the proceed that we've, we've, here we've got, you know, just the way that the, the world reveals itself to conscious experience because people just run a mile and they don't know what you're talking about and yeah. it's not really help, helpful to anybody. And also theatre practitioners themselves might benefit from some of the terminology that I've introduced. So that's a little bit about um, sort of the, the origin of where yeah. I was trying to do it. And as for the pitch itself, um, I, I guess... So strategically, like I picked three very Western canonical texts to approach and to think about this in the book. And I think maybe, you know, that's got its faults and it's got its, its pluses, but, you know, hopefully the fact that this sort of stuff might get picked up in conservatoires and theatre studies departments around the world where these texts serve as key touchstones and then launching off to say, OK, well, we might look at intercultural processes and non-Western performance processes and devised processes and, you know, and physical theatre processes using the same thing. So really it's starting um, yeah. with, with the core and then, and then saying, OK, but... And there's more. Yeah. Yeah. What's really nice about, I think, both your books is this... that I think standpoint is actually a key organising principle... Um, and I'll, I'll flick now to Lisa Marie because I'm going to get you to... I was going to ask you a few questions just generally about, about your book before asking Dan about his again. But so, so um, for instance, you use um, Indigenous standpoint theory. Yes. And do you want to just, I mean, give us a kind of idiot's guide to what what that is, just in a yep. nutshell, or how you sure. embraced Look, it? Yep. Yep. Um, it's... It's a recent kind of, um, approach to research, mm. and it and it's it's about uh, acknowledging and recognizing the indigenous worldview, um, or epistemologies, axologies, and ontology. ontologies. Thank you, um, as a way of, as a way of framing um, research, or in, instead of taking maybe you know dead white um, philosophers and trying to frame an Indigenous uh, perspective within, it's like within those frameworks. So it's like trying, and, and a lot of Indigenous um, scholars struggle with that yeah. because that's the way we have to uh, articulate mm -hmm. what we know um, within the academy. Yeah, do you feel that's partly why there hadn't been, before your book, there just hadn't been um, real observation of Indigenous theatre making. Do you feel that's is that there were researchers who literally didn't know how to approach it, or well, felt the re they shouldn't, yeah. or felt you know? Uh, it's interesting. I mean, most of the readings are, are of productions, so um, academics would analyse productions through various um, lenses and perspectives. Um, but getting into the room, I think, was the the stumbling block. Uh, for a lot of scholars or researchers. Do you mean access issues? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what? Because um, obviously I was your sponsor for yes. your QRM, <laughs> um, and you know, and you you did all the heavy lifting in yes. terms of getting access and everything that you yes. did to do that. With 
what was it like turning up to day one of rehearsals? So, like, for people who don't know much about rehearsal studies, don't even know how would you even approach this methodologically. So, you rock up, it's day one, mm. you're, where are you sitting in the room? Like, what, yep. what happens? It was dependent on each context. So, with uh, and, and each approach to, to getting into the room, um, was different in Aotearoa, in Turtle Island, and in uh, even here in my home city on Gadigal land. So um, turning up to the first day, I guess if I would say in Wellington, it was amazing because um, uh, Ma the Maori kind of theatre makers see their work as as Fano, uh, as family. Um, and so the first day is all about kissing each other and introducing each other and making cups of tea and, and eating biscuits and that kind of thing. And everyone's sitting and waiting and welcoming everybody into the space. And that was just, you know, and that was every day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're here again. Um, so. And were you in but, a... But can I just say, oh, sorry. in Canada, it was freezing cold <laughs> and, and it was also a kind of cold reception. Uh, for, for me because I was a researcher and I think there's it's there's a big problem being a researcher in Indigenous space for various reasons, even if you are Indigenous um, and, and even from a different cultural context. So each, each one was different, yeah. How did you deal with the coldness? Like, I mean, the co <laughs> as in the, the kind of, with the, with the participants? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was like being tolerated. Uh, a little bit, yeah, but which is good. I mean, it was perfect. I could just sit in the room and nobody bothered me and document what was going on. What did documenting look like? What were you literally putting on a page? It was different. I mean, there was the same methodology, but there was different way of recording and documenting in each context because of various uh, laws around documenting rehearsals. For, for example, in Canada, you, you can't document video record rehearsals. Um, so there I had to meticulously try and document everything that was going on and everything that was being said. So it was a lot of writing. Mm. In uh, Wellington and Aotearoa, I was allowed to have a video in the room. So I was able to get a research assistant. And so I could then just say, you know, if I was, I could actually sit and watch yeah. a lot more without meticulously documenting because yeah. I knew I could go back and watch what was going on and here in Australia it was I was not in the room documenting I was in the practice itself going home and writing in a journal every night yeah 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 so really different methodological yes. approaches depending on each context yeah. yeah not one size fits all yeah, yeah. wow okay thank you um, I'm going to flick to Dan now. Um, in terms of, um, yeah, so when th there's a line you have in your um, in your book where you say theatre making has a particular capacity to shine a light on being. Mm. Um, could you just chat about that? A bit? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, and and, why, and, and yeah. what I would say also is that do you think Stanislavski's method? offers that, uh, you know, in a, in a more pronounced way. Ah, OK. Um, so I guess that, so the, the, a chapter in my first book was on Stanislavski and it was also published as a, um, a journal article as well. And that was looking at Stanislavski's approach, uh, the method of physical actions, and taking apart different elements of his terminology and thinking about how they're asking the same sorts of questions that a phenomenologist might ask. So for instance, you know, he, his emphasis on action sort of in a way maps onto a phenomenological analysis of involved actions. And, um, you know, so I've written about this, about, um, you know, the way that we relate to equipment in our environment. Mm. And then that also then relates back to other people that we exist in the world with. And so in order to understand any individual action, you've got to sort of pull on this thread. And, and so I think, you know, in a way, that's one way of looking at it, but it's, it's not the only way. Um, but more broadly, why theatre making sheds something on the question of being, I think, is because when you place something in a theatrical setting, you're not simply 
attending to that thing as an object of use. You've, it's a very special situation where we can sit back and we can start to consider all of these relations that, um, you know, that person on stage or that, you know, the prop telephone there, what's the context of that, what's the world which that's occupying. It allows the audience and other actors and the, the actor, you know, developing their role to sort of pick apart that whole notion of worldhood. Okay. You know, what, what so a is, world. So weirdly, I mean, now I'm going to, you know, chuck Wecht in here. Is it, <laughs> is it the making strange that that is at the heart of theatre making? Like, as in your... The, the fact that it's an object that then has a frame around it, you're seeing the object in a strange way than you would in everyday life when it disappears through its use? Um, it's, I mean, like a Brechtian effect is one way of showing that. And in fact, it's a particular social relationship that, you know, if you're taking Brecht's approach, he's, he's thinking about what, what are the power relations that are set out with this way, this gesture, this handshake, or this object which is placed here, who has access to it, who has ownership of it. Um, but more in a sense of a defamiliarization of the frame the, of theatre itself, possibly. Um, but my focus here has been actually on the approach of the theatre maker. Mm. So um, it might not necessarily just be dr driven by a social dimension. So if you're developing a character, um, you know, you, you might need to think about what you're doing in that scene from a range of different perspectives there as well. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Do you feel like... I mean, this is going to sound blunt, but do you feel like, you know, you want to say to an actor, read this book, it'll make you a better actor? Um, yeah, no, no. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't want to ram anything <laughs> no, down anyone's throat. No, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. as in, I, like, I was interested earlier when you said, I imagine this book... And then I was wait, and, and you said it, which was great. You said appearing in maybe undergrad theatre. I was trying because right. I was thinking like the uptake of it because I think it's unusual the book. Um, so it's like where, in part, as I was reading, I was thinking, yeah, am I like if I was an actor, am I reading this? Would it will it deepen my practice? Is it more of a mind mm. thing? Like, is it more of a conceptual thing of like this is going to make us all think deep more deeply about? Um, uh, thinking through phenomenology in a mm. richer way, you, you know what I mean? So I, so I wouldn't wouldn't put it in a should um, context at all. Good. No, 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 no. And and so again, this gets back to you know the origin question. There's the, the when I was in Sheffield, the, the first workshop that I ran with this sort of stuff in a practical sense was a mix of students and of professional actors. Mm. And what was really interesting, the younger professional actors, listening, absorbing, getting it all in, <laughs> yep, okay, yeah, I can get that. Whereas the older actors are go, oh yeah, okay, that's interesting. Let's do the exercise. Oh, yep, that's interesting. And then at the end of it, you know, do you think that this is be useful? I'm, oh, I pretty much got my toolkit. It's okay, thanks very much. <laughs> um, whereas the students are kind of like just grappling, oh my God, there's professional actors here. I've got to do this practical thing. And then also Daniel's trying to get me to think about, <laughs> about broad, broad sort of philosophical questions. And a lot of what I was trying, and, and this is really what I was trying to do with the book is to make the theory accessible in a mm. non-threatening way. Mm. So that's why I say it's not a should. It's just a different way of thinking about that may be useful to your process. And it may also stimulate different ways of approaching that particular text. Um, and I was having a conversation earlier on today. It's, it's also interesting that each of the chapters are focused on texts and offering phenomenological investigations of that rather than an ethnography of my practice doing this sort of thing it's almost like here's a frame for phenomenological reading and then you could you can experiment with lots mm. of different ways mm. of approaching this text or another text it's it's up to yeah. you so it's I, not a should yeah what a word you just used there um was accessible which um what what's um i think both the books you these books and i said this to you guys earlier are just really beautiful like um and and they are, i mean not to sound naff but they're quite beautiful in spirit like it's and i think and writing is really 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 hard and yes. writing, writing a book is really 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 hard so I wanted to actually talk about writing and and so Lisa Marie 
How did you find the narrating voice for your book? It's beautiful. Like, how did you how did you develop it? How did you find it? Where, how I did just, you land? You I just know? want to go back and, and talk about that accessibility because what yeah. I found was from that time at UCID was that all the phenomenologists made it accessible. Like, for someone like myself who didn't come necessarily from an academic background, every time one of you got up to to speak, you absolutely took me on that journey and I knew exactly what you were saying. And I think that's a strength of Australian scholars, mm -hmm. is their ability to interpret kind of complex philosophical um, concepts um, and make them accessible for mm -hmm. audiences. And, you know, I mean, I think at some point we should have a conversation because, you know, there's lots in my book about um, a sense of embodying uh, uh, an indigenous sensibility mm. um, and also around working with objects as as cultural objects mm. um, yeah so we should have a conversation mm. at some point because I'm just listening to you going oh mm. I wish I, we should have a chat We're about that. Having so, a conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have a conversation. So, so can I can I just jump I mean but this, yeah. this might be more towards yeah. the end but yeah. um, so I was helping one of our researchers out here on a, um, an indigenous research project in the local space around us um, and there were some Indigenous participants, and I just mentioned, you know, I, like I happen to be a, a theatre scholar as well, and I write about phenomenology. Oh, what's that? Oh, no, isn't mm. it? It's the way that we experience the world. So mm. I talked about how I do an activity of just getting people to perceive the environment around them and the way that the, the air hits your, your, your face and, mm. you know, the, the, the movement and the colours and the relationships of space. And, and she said, oh, yeah, that's just like being on country. Yeah. And, <laughs> that's right. yeah, 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 that's how and we brought up. That's right, that's yeah. right. And so, I, so for me, that's a fascinating crossover is, um, and, and it, it's the word, an openness mm. to your, your environment. It's the way you get into it, isn't it? Like, it's, it's about being and embodying the in land, mm. in a way. But a kind of Western approach is to think about that process first before you get in there. Like, to conceptualise what you're doing yep. and name it and articulate it, yep. rather than just being which is yeah. but it, that's the output isn't it that's that's the end point mm. is to just be mm, mm. on country mm, mm. yeah or just to be in yeah mm. experience uh the voice can yeah. we get back to that yeah 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 um i guess what is that little thing there? Joining us. oh great <laughs> hello <laughs> it's a win every time yeah, <laughs> yeah. um i think i think because with with um Going through all the different styles of ethnographic writing um, and reading a whole lot of ways in which to write, to kind of approach this writing of the book, um, I think I got kind of carried away with the travel writing as <laughs> ethnographic writing um, because I was going to places and other people's country that I think I should have, well, I did. I had to include that country in the conversation and the only way I could think about writing in that way is, oh, if I'm a travel, I'm travelling and I'm travelling on other people's countries, so I'll describe what I'm doing. Mm. So there's a little bit of that in there, like here I am, I've never been here before and this is what I'm seeing and this is what I'm noticing. And then of course there's the conversations that you have informally where people tell you about their experience of country and, and their relationship uh, through their genealogies to, to various places and locations. And that's included in there as well as part of that story. Um, but story writing and narrative writing seemed appropriate for an indigenous way of creating um, the book. Yeah. Um, and, the, and putting those stories together and story weaving especially. So there are, there are times when I kind of talk about the bigger concepts and then come back to the kind of individual stitches and then we come back out and look at what we're making or in the book, where the book's going and then and then come back into the individual stitches and everybody's contribution to that, to this story. Yeah, so structurally really hard. Yes. Like, like <laughs> years and years and years yeah. of thought and yeah. and to work on tone like yes. and I think like that was what struck me with both your books is the very warm tone in which they're written it's they're I think beautiful. it's care yeah yeah I, I, I think yeah. and like I've been looking recently at um, this idea of curation as care and in a way the, we are creating we are curating these stories into a kind of a broader a larger narrative mm. and you have to do that with care because 
people have given you their stories, yeah. allowed you into their spaces, um, you know, let let you tell them what to do in a classroom, yeah. uh, allow you to to you know teach and mentor and. So I there think has to what, be an element of care. With yeah, that. I mean the great success of your book, and there are many of them, Lisa Marie. But one of them is that you could hand this to a researcher who knows nothing about theatre, like an academic in the corridor. You could also hand it to community, like yeah. your community, yeah. and they would get it. They yeah. would understand. So, how was that trying to straddle that, where you are doing justice to just a number of fields simultaneously? Number of fields or p communities like oh uh, readers yes, mm. yes. Um, I had to be true to each community um, and tell their stories as though their community were reading their stories yeah um, and then finding a way to find their stories accessible to us I mean they're interesting and it, it, it normally it's it's just about um, contextualizing the cultural contexts that the reader is about to go into and the way in which the journey that led to being inside that that context mm. um, brings is meant to bring the reader with you, yeah. so that when you were when we're we're all in the space and I'm talking about what's going on, they've come on that journey with you. Yeah. 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 That's great. I mean, this and this whole idea of journey. I think it's appropriate to to, to talk about your book in that way as well. Structurally, visually, really different. So you know, you've got breakout boxes. That you know what I mean? Mm. Like you've got mm. there are exercises. There are like it's a it's a different it's a it's a different invitation um, to engage. Mm. And whereas narrative is like the main kind mm. of um, mode you're using, and you even said you know you you were mobilising some of those genres like travel writing, even and like mm. a whole bunch mm. of different storytelling techniques yep. to take us through yep. it. There's there was a different kind of. Um, voice working for you I think in your book when you said earlier that it was bought uh, it made a lot of sense when you said earlier that it emerged from those that course mm, that we taught mm, mm. you know that I think did we all teach on that course at some point I think maybe oh, yeah, 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 yeah that's definitely. it it's in the uni a thousand years ago um, 2601 but, yeah, yeah 2601 um so yeah. okay so with um so did you do just, some embodiment stuff no, I, I mean, I, you were you were the lecturer. Yeah, I yeah. taught you, oh, yeah. and I was your associate supervisor. Oh, yeah. so that was <laughs> full disclosure. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, but So I was going to say, how did you arrive um, at the book structure? Yeah. Did it land quite easily for you? Um, if you tell me it did, I'll kill you. <laughs> like, but, you know, just... <laughs> um, uh, uh, so so the, the phenomenologist that I write about most is is Heidegger and he is he, is problematic of course with his political involvements with national socialism etc and, and in a way there's there's some elements of my book which try to critique that by emphasizing um you know our being with others and our relationship to others as being um you know crucial to our understanding of self too and I, I don't think he really ever got there and you know that that that's that's slightly problematic but actually if you look at it the structure of my book follows pretty closely the structure of being in time as cat categories of things which I pluck out to say, OK, we just start with involvement and equipment and, you know, our relationship to material objects around mm. as present at hand, etc. That's the first chapter, you know, and then I start to think a little bit more about being with others and, you know, that that becomes the, the, the second core chapter with the cherry orchard and then the more existential stuff about, you know, the, the way that we encounter being and the way that we exist towards other people in authenticity, um, you know, in relation to Hamlet. And mm. if I offer self-critique, um, you know, that's an artificial structure which I'm imposing on all, each of those all texts. Structures are artificial. That's right. That's right. But I, I try. Composed. But I. But I try to acknowledge that by offering th those break, breakout boxes are precisely for that and say, look, I'm doing this exercise with this text with this frame around it. Um, but you can equally do that with lots of other, other different things. Um, by the same token, I've tried to make the argument that actually, if you look at Hamlet, those existential themes are actually in the text itself. Mm. And so that's the caveat there is, if, if you're going to try any of these exercises, don't artificially impose 
something on the text that's not actually there. And, yeah. you know, directors will always talk yeah. about this, won't they? Won't they? Is, you know, audiences can tell if, you know, a director has to totally turned something on its head and there's something that doesn't quite ring true. And so then that, that brings to the, the last chapters are much more dwelling on, they actually go beyond being in, in time from 1927 and it goes into Heidegger's later works which mm. are much more um, esoteric yeah. and um, more difficult to sort of just so really I've just grabbed a few concepts from that uh, you know like um, you know his um, uh, analysis of um, technology and mm. you know those sorts of things and they're not attached to specific texts there it's more just spe speculative of saying actually here's another way of thinking about these things, which mm. is in a different way, but trying to make them clear. Um, and then winding right back, you know, to my pitch, and I was talking about this before, you know, I think if anyone's considering pitching a book, my strategy has been to publish one key chapter as a journal article, mm. and you get that out there as a sample piece of your writing that's really gone through a rigorous process of peer review. And then, then you structure around that a range of other chapters which you can put together to make sense of a much larger piece of work. Mm -hmm. And so I use conference presentations and um, research seminar presentations to test out proto versions of those chapters that are there. So it's, I always talk about it as a washing machine. You know, you've got to just keep putting washing in the washing yeah, machine. Yeah. Take the dirty stuff out first. No, I don't know. <laughs> but, but it is, it's like feeding the, sorry, feeding the machine um, that, that you know that that's going to come out there. And it's, it actually isn't a process of sitting down and going, right, I'm going to write a book today. Yeah. Um, it's actually something you've been working on in a mm. sustained way mm. in a range of different contexts over yeah. a number of years. Yeah. Yep, I'm so glad you answered it like that. Um, I, earlier you said, um, meaning that you didn't say it was actually really easy and you did it, no. knocked it off in six months. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> what I was going to say, earlier you said something really, or you said many interesting things, but one of them had to do with this idea of a director, you know, will always caution against actors or imposing something onto the text that isn't there. So Lisa, Lisa Marie, in your um, writing, mm. you mentioned, you talk about playwrights as um, territorial agents. Uh, uh, uh. And it was just yeah. such a great term. And I was like, yeah. what does she mean by that? So um, could you tell us what you meant by that? The playwright, the indigenous playwrights as territorial agents. Yes. Um, well, it's, 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 about, it's about claiming a rehearsal space as a sovereign space. Mm. So for um, an indigenous story to be told. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of rituals or ceremonies that may begin any rehearsal process and that, that's often around cleansing the space so there'll be, and it depends on different cultural contexts of course. Um, in in um, Turtle Island there was um, you know a sage clearing and the playwright actually um, did this ceremony with all of the people in the room. Uh, here in Australia we often do a smoking you know to clear the space because you know, ultimately the spaces are Western constructs, mm. um, and but it's on Aboriginal land, so it's around making that deep connection to mm. to again country mm. that sits underneath, so that this this story, this this ceremony, which people s often see, you know, stories being told as ceremony, um, uh, has that deep connection, and that mm. that's what gives it. Its power. So that's what I mean by territorial agent is is taking taking inverting the world yeah. um, back to a sense of indigeneity, so that the work can begin on stories. Because I mean, ultimately, stories are sacred, and um, there's a sense of that. And carrying stories and delivering stories and allowing other people to carry that story. Mm. So that's what I mean by territorial agent it, what was so <laughs> because in certainly in a lot of western theater making it's the director who you would almost attach that term to more than wouldn't you think the playwright i don't know like i know there are different it mm. depends on the status of the playwright whatever but it just was so and then i wondered is the playwright in the room yes so the playwright's in the room yes so this is where i was just like okay yes. so what mm. you know structurally what is happening yep. here and then is the play and then what are the conversations between the playwright and the yep. director yes well, ultimately, that because we all, we all have have a you know a heightened sense of what is an indigenous story, it belongs to the person who wrote it, mm. yeah. And this is what we now identify as indigenous theatre, yeah. It has to be written by an indigenous person, so it's it makes sense that 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 story holder is in the room, 
Mm. You know, even mm. if it's a story not about indigeneity, but they wrote it, so they're mm. in the room, they need to be guiding that process in some yeah. way and to be ensuring that that story is being carried in, carried in the right way. Mm. Um, in And again, it was in three different contexts. So in, in Aotearoa, it was the writer who, who was also the director. Yeah. Um, here it was, I was the director. <laughs> Um, and the writers were, were kind of dramaturging their own show, um, putting it together. And the interesting thing about what happened in, happened in Turtle Island was that it was non-Indigenous actors and a non-Indigenous director um, who was given carriage of this Indigenous story. Mm. Um, and that, I guess, having three different one, approaches, it was a great way to bounce ideas around. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's so interesting. This idea of the the person who carries the story. Um, it uh, um, one of the things that you bring up in your book, Dan, which is this idea of a theory of of selfhood, and how certain acting theories, uh, you know, embody in I don't know what the right verb is, um, enact a theory mm. of self. Mm. And so this theory of self that's mm. going on here mm. in, in the way you've just described mm. does feel different to the kind of... Yeah, so and that's precisely probably the, the, the problem that was happening in the Turtle Island story is that there was a conflict of different understandings of self between the performers and the story that as it was set out that was actually not accessible exactly. one between the other. Exactly. And the way they got into it was they had a non-Indigenous um, movement uh, person mm. who who and it was only through this kind of creation of gest gestural language mm. um, that they were able to embody this sense of indigeneity, mm. Um, mm. which was you know at, that, that they were really trying to but could not get past their training, so they were always coming back to what what is what's my motivation? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Where, where am I meant to stand? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, like, yeah. What, what what am I doing with this object? You know, and yeah. so that was incredibly frustration for the frustrating for the playwright mm. who just really wanted them to try and get this sense of being yeah. um, through the words and the story that was and the actions that were outlined because there were yeah. keys in it and and the playwright tried to get them to understand the keys that were the indigenous keys to unlock that mm. that way in to those characters mm. so that the actors could embody this sense of indigeneity but mm. they just they just didn't have the tools mm. yeah. you know it's it's actually there's this parallels with you know um units that have taught on shakespeare as well and you know it actually comes back to the same sort of question is what what sense of self existed in an early modern context you know, you have to understand about the humours and the great chain of being and, you know, um, the structural society at the time and, mm. you know, what... And, and, of course, the professor that we both w worked with, um, Tim Fitzpatrick, about understanding the actual spatial resources yeah. of the stage in order to understand what the playwright had coded into the yes. text itself. Yeah. I, I mean, I love that sort exit of stuff. Chase Wibbe. Well, exit yeah. Chase Wibbe. But it's, it's more... It's, it's, it's more um, Shakespeare has already told you where you need yeah. to go in this text. So yeah. if you go somewhere where you're not meant to go, it's just going to look silly. And yeah. so he uses that example of, you know, the gentlewoman and the doctor coming in and watch, watching Lady Macbeth in her sleepwalking scene. And then, you know, the doctor pretty much says, you know, look after her and make sure that nothing bad happens to her. And in one production, he saw the, the gentlewoman just, yes, yes, of course, and walks off in completely the wrong direction from where... Um, Lady Macbeth has gone, so that's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. But you know, in much more of a, a cultural sense, you know, this is this is this is what we're, we're talking about here. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking what you were talking more about space as well, and and you know, because I, I, I was saying before, I used to teach in this space here, and you know, I'm fascinated with rehearsal spaces, how they imbue a sense of the history mm. of what's actually happened in this space. Mm. So where we are now used to be the Australian Film, Television and Radio yes. School. Yeah. Mm. And I did an, like an internship here as an undergraduate and running the production at the back. And then it became part of the, you know, the Faculty of Arts. And, you know, for me, I had a personal history of, of, of here. But you, you go to Belvoir or you go to, you know, um, Gr Griffin Theatre, um, uh, the stables, and the, there's a sense of history and place there. Mm. But, I mean, 
where does where does an indigenous site sit in that you know mm -hmm. when when you're performing in Marrickville and mm. something or in Redfern and mm. there's something that that happened just outside there and mm. it actually lends a special significance to what's actually happening in that space that someone who doesn't have access to that history yes. just won't be able to understand the significance of no. did that come up in those rehearsal processes at all mm. Was it not, or was it's it more the, of that clearing that was going on? It's more of the clearing, yeah, and clearing that space for you know, so so that it, that example doesn't happen. And then you know, even while you're saying that, I'm thinking about a number of you know shows that were site specific mm. that 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 had these interventions, this historical interventions, um, and yeah, they were haunted spaces mm. as well. Mm. So um, yeah, the clearing normally does a lot of that work. Mm. Um, yeah, um, interesting. Like the Maori um, playwrights didn't—I mean, the Maori theatre makers didn't do a clearing necessarily. They did a prayer, mm. which was about um, kind of bringing in, bringing in the ancestors, which is similar to the other clearings. So there's this kind of deep, deep connection going on with um, land and country, but it's also about this deep connection with with um, the ancestors, yeah. um, you know, that recognition that the story that you're holding is is been something that's been carried geni in a genealogically logical way. Yeah. Mm. Um, so that that kind of thing is going on, and uh, and I guess you know that understanding that yeah we're in a box, okay, but making the box <laughs> something, you know, tearing down the walls of the box so that that's, so that you know this ceremony can begin. Mm. Mm. You know, rehearsal is ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, that's a beautiful moment to open this out to questions. So do we have any questions? Are there any questions in the chats, Andrew Robson? No question in the chat as yet, um, <laughs> but I will stay tuned. It's, it's interesting, that term clearing that's there, because, you know, this, it comes up, um, you know, in, the, in Heidegger's writing about a clearing as a space in the forest where you are actually able to see what's around you. Yes. And it's it's more like, it's it's also a, a lighting, a shining, you know. Yeah. That, but actually in order, you need to clear a space in order to see what's yes. there. So yes. there's kind of a paradox yes. about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, like there is no empty space. That's right. So Peter Brook is <laughs> em em empty space. It's full. That's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's where my phenomenological stuff is. It's allowing something to show itself. Yes. Yeah. So that's kind of the clearing, that's mm, the space mm. and that, that might be, you know, an, an ancestral allowing and showing. Mm. But what, one, one question I've got and I can't Cause really... Because it's interesting, I mean, I mean, I think, you know, for non-Indigenous actors, they come into a space like this and they would embrace the kind of, the, the history of what's happened in this theatrical construct. Yeah. Um, and that's their process. Yeah. You know, and it's okay to say that there are different ways into working mm. um, and different theatre making practices and that's really why I guess this book for me was important mm. is to say no actually we do it differently mm. we have different approaches we have different ways of working we have different ways of seeing we have different ways of embodying our characters mm. um, and and we need to kind of embrace that mm. um, and we've been trying to articulate it mm. um, for a very long time um, and I think it's gone from, for me, um, Indigenous theatre practice was very much first up about, oh, we can do it your way, we can understand mm. what your um, process mm. is, your mm. concepts, you know, your, your methodologies of, of making theatre. Um, but then there was this kind of, there's been, there is this turn happening and it's about, no, actually, we need to embrace our own understanding of what we're doing and the way in which we do it, because we know when we work in non-Indigenous contexts, theatrical contexts, um, that it isn't the way that we would work. Yeah, yeah. There's a question. We do have a question, um, but um, Catherine, I c can I ask you to unmute? We have the technology that you can actually ask can the question around? yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Fabulous. Hi. Oh, hi, Lisa Marie, and hi, Andrew, and hi, Kate. Thanks for a really great discussion. I'm really glad I tuned in. Um, Lisa Marie, I was just, and I, I knew a little bit about your trips to Canada and New Zealand when I worked a tiny bit with you 
um, at Macquarie, but I did see the wonderful work at the Biennale that you oh, yes. um, worked on with, um, I think, Rie Noir and others, and yep. it's at Pier 23. And yep. I wondered whether, you know, the, the oral and visual storytelling that is in that is really phenomenal. Does this either get discussed in the book or how does the work done in your book interact with that piece that's currently showing? Does it have any relation? Um, its only relation is that um, relationship around relationship building and um, mm. collaboration. Um, so the connection it has is this book was done in 2000. I mean, the research for this was done in 2004 and 2005. Um, and it's taken that long to, to put it all together. Um, no, 15, sorry. 15. I was going to say, I was going to say, I'm sure I wasn't working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. No, sorry, yeah. You jumped a decade there. 2014, 2015. Um, so it's, it, it's taken that long to kind of put it, put it together. But a lot of the relationships that were made during this research project are still um, continuing. So the relationship with our First Nations theatre makers, um, well, for, for, for myself and for, the, for Mugulun, um, have were, were really based in some of spending time with these theatre makers and building those relationships, like with Native Earth Performing Arts. Um, mm. And so the, the work with Anna Mantagze, um, the, the collaborations have come through our, you know, meeting artists at those um, places and forming those, building those relationships. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But by the book, well, it's, it's <laughs> come out at a, at a really, I would say it's come at an incredibly timely, it's come out at such a wonderful time mm. in that that work at the Biennale and that, you know, just the amount of talk at the moment with Indigenous languages in 20, oh, yeah, yeah. 20 totally. to 22. It's just yeah. kind of like a perfect synthesis. And when you think about how long it's taken, it was not that yeah. long really, tw 2015 yeah. to 2022 is only seven years, but yeah. it's, yeah. But um, I mean, that was a lot of the problem with, with getting the book out was that a lot of the things I was writing about, I felt like was getting away from me. It was too dated. It wasn't relevant anymore. And I had to kind of restructure the whole thing um, in order to make it relevant. So framing it from an Indigenous standpoint, mm -hmm. which, we, which is a kind of new and fresh approach to research. Mm -hmm. um, and already I'm feeling like, you know, I flag in the book at the end around language mm. and the importance of language and how it's becoming and suddenly it's just it's like exploding um, and I'm struggling to keep up so my current research project is going through all the old plays all the old texts and and picking out language and then going through a literature search of all the writings about these plays right and none of them mention language mm. like it's mm. it, it's been completely overlooked mm. and and in my approach to looking at language, say, in the Firstborn trilogy, sorry, I'm going off book. No, um, uh, I've noticed that, you know, as you say, the playwrights are coding. Mm. Um, there is a narrative in there just by looking at language mm. that what he was trying, what Jack Davis was trying to say mm. about what was happening to, mm. to language in, in, in Western Australia and with Noongar and, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, language is exploding and it's just going to get away if we don't keep up. <laughs> and that's why we did that project completely in language. Um, and most of us are all doing language courses at the moment. And hmm. it's, um, super yeah, it's, it's, it's making its way in. For example, can I just, I'm just really yeah, excited by this. Really so yeah, I'm sorry yeah. for taking over. That's all right. For example, now what we're doing at Mugulin is every time we work with a, a playwright, um, or a, or a, a maker, um, we, we're taking language terms from their country right. um, or their language nation uh, around what is a director and what is a dramaturg, so what is overseeing, what is um, the outside eye, mm. and using that terminology to describe the practice for each of the people they're working with um, from that country. Yeah, and see that would have ontological implications. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and that's, that's where it's going.
Yeah, but the, wow. But that's you also so interesting. talked in your book about the collaborative nature of the, the processes as well, and that seems to be something that's intrinsic in this. It's, it's not hierarchical that you've got no. a director and the director says, you go and stand over there. Oh, God, and this no. is, but there's something else that's, that's <laughs> happening, in, and, and that's drawing on yeah. respect, yeah. listening, yes. responsibility to others, all of those sorts of things. It's also a common understanding of experiences, like there's a, there's yeah. a commonality of you know colonisation, and and they are things that are being worked through in a lot of these stories as well. Yeah. So it's about talking through that, and you can't just talk at people. You, mm-hmm. You've all <laughs> you've all <laughs> you've all had varying experiences, yeah. um, depending on where where you grew up or what community you grew you you kind of yeah grew up in. Mm-hmm. Mm. We may yeah. have, uh, a question from Bridget. Bridget, did you have a question? Yes, I did. Thanks, Andrew. Um, First of all, well, we'll start with a comment, um, which is congratulations to um, both of you on um, the recent um, publication of your books. I know um, they've um, been out for a little... Indeed, indeed. And also, I've been tweeting the the web links so people can actually order them. Um, but it's um, it's really nice to, ha- and it seems appropriate to have you in the drama studio at Macquarie. I'm sorry I'm not there in person, thanks to the dentist. Um, uh, Anne-Marie, it's, uh, Lisa Marie, it's fantastic to see this um, as, as the culmination of your MQRF um, fellowship. And I think back to the conversations that we used to have in the building you're, you're back in now. It wasn't 2004 to five, thank heavens, but, uh, <laughs> um, but um, I was wondering about um, your um, own sort of experience and expertise as an actor and a director and how that kind of influenced, um, do you think, how you were received when you were actually doing your ethnographic research and how also it might have affected um the way in which you um, analysed, um, uh, well, conducted your analysis? Yeah, um, good question. There's two parts to that, isn't there? Yeah, <laughs> sorry, so yeah, feel so free to answer. How were you received? Yeah, how were you received? Um, yeah. Look, I thought it would open the door, but it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I also tried to kind of, you know, meet, uh, introduce myself through other people, you know, and that first cold bite, I guess. Um, you know, I understand you know so-and-so, I've, you know, we're colleagues and blah, mm. that kind of thing. But it didn't really help in the end because... I, and I, I had a conversation about this. That you are being received as a researcher, whether you're a theatre maker or a, um, an, an Indigenous person or not, um, and research, it comes with a pretty dirty kind of stain to it in in a lot of Indigenous contexts, primarily because a lot of knowledge has been appropriated um, uh, and a lot of um, books have been written and stories have been taken and, you know, and there's a lot of mistrust of researchers. Mm. Um, so that was difficult. And I, and I will say, knowing that, that when I returned to those places as a theatre maker, like as mm. from, from, you know, work as a delegate from Mughalan Performing Arts, I was received in a very different way. Um, but there was still a little tinge, you know, of, oh, you know, I better watch out what I say to her. She, mm. might, <laughs> she might, might write it down, book, yeah. you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, yeah, I guess... You've, you've just got to accept that you'll always be received with a little bit of suspicion, mm. <laughs> mm. Um, which is unfortunate because you just want to, f- you know, feel part of something. But you have to, you have to ha- have that feeling in order to make that strange. Yeah. You know, otherwise yeah, yeah. people will critique what you're doing as, you know, it, as Indigenous research isn't actually research because you're too close to it. Mm. Um, and then what about this good question of Bridget's that has to do with... Um, the way you were seeing and hearing mm. and engaging because of your own yeah. background, actually, yeah. as a performer. It's really hard to put that aside mm. and to just see and just just to to be neutral. And, of course, you cannot be neutral, which no. is why you asked that question. Um, but it was trying to just focus on what was being said and what people were doing mm. and documenting that 
and staying away from your own kind of creative analytical process <laughs> um, of I wouldn't say that and I wouldn't do that and I would <laughs> I wouldn't get them to do that and it's very hard also because sometimes outside you know because you say like, you've it's good to go outside and have these informal chats because they add to the story. Um, you mean outside the, the rehearsal room? Yes, yeah, you, you know, for the smoke break, the break or yeah. morning tea or a <laughs> cup of coffee or, hmm. or that kind of thing. And um, sometimes the director would say to me, so how do you think it's going? <laughs> <laughs> and, hmm. you know, and you have to kind of say, oh, yeah, it's, it's great. You know, you're going really well. And, and then explain it's difficult for me to give you any feedback hmm. because that's not why I'm here. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. Could I could I jump in there with a bit of a methodological thing as well mm. um, about observing an object? So so what, one of the um, or an experience. So one of the um, exercises that that I ran with these actors um, was getting them to take a walk outside in the middle of Sheffield, down through the bus shelter, and then back back up. And we took a, we videoed this little walk. Um, and I published this in, in one of those journal articles that I, I was talking about before, and I actually uploaded a video of that walk, of that experience, but then we got each of the performers to record into a little voice recorder what their experience of that Watching activity... Themselves. activity. No, 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 oh. and act the activity. So when we got back into the room, we just said, OK, we want everyone just to go aside, you get your voice recorder, and I want you to reflect on all of the different experiences that you just had in that moment. Mm. And um, for me, the, it was a bit of a penny drop moment of actually using voice recorders and getting people to reflect on scaffolded reflection on, mm. you know, different elements of their relationship to an experience is really interesting. And I, I would love to develop this further um, in the future. But then we did overlay the video mm. footage of the mm. experience itself with some clips. Mm. So it was almost like we were jumping in people's mm. mind of, mm. well, it was a gust of wind that came as they passed by that thing. And then... <laughs> and that and reminds then, me of the how you see yourself and how others see you. Yeah, Or right. how you see yourself outside of your yourself that is an interesting th yeah yeah um it, it is and 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 of course this is the problem with performing is that um you know it's a classic thing with dance say for instance as soon as you become aware of yourself dancing Self you drop out of the moment yeah. and then bang yeah. oh stuffed up yeah um but but this this particular um technique allows people to ref reflect afterwards after mm. an activity but then to sort of regain some of those um pre-predicative, like the, the mm. pre-linguistic articulation of what it's like when they're still close enough to remember some of those senses mm. and experiences. Anyway, I, I just thought it, it's an interesting way of taking, you know, lay people and giving them a scaffold to reflect on experience that won't necessarily be, um, I'm an ethnographer and I'm watching you and I'm watching yeah. all of your actions. It gives it gives participants an opportunity to actually articulate their, their insider. Yeah. And, and then, of course, you know, maybe there's a problem then of unreliable memory or, you know, maybe there's maybe they're self-censoring because they don't want to, you know... Um, yeah, there's a partiality in that's yeah. That's, yeah. that's right there. Yeah. So it's never going to completely... What you're including and excluding. That's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry to riff off yeah. that, no, but no, I just no, thought no, it was no, interesting. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're saying the same thing, but in a different language. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> Andrew Robson, <laughs> is there another... There's... Are there, oh, Bridget? Yeah, you're on the air. <laughs> um, it's it's me again, um, Daniel. I know this isn't your first book, so that's that's very impressive. Um, but um, you're also, um, of course, our valued um, research manager, uh, partnerships manager at, at Macquarie. Is there something else that I can ask that that you're working on, or if you had all of the time in the world, like what would the next kind of project or intellectual inquiry be for you? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, yes, there, there is. So again, I was talking about this um, earlier on today. So I'm moving more into the Shakespeare area now and I'm trying to work up a, a book pitch on Shakespeare and phenomenology. There's a working title, Shakespeare's Being in the World. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Um, Good title. And, yeah. So, um, so again, like I've published a, a, a key chapter last year, last year, some relatively recent time in the hazy 
yes, couple of past year, um, uh, on Macbeth and um, uh, temporality. Mm -hmm. So within that play, the experience of time and how Shakespeare actually encoded a sense of time, both in the mm -hmm. language and, and also the way that he put the text together that it really speeds up towards the end of it. So that's going to be my sort of key chapter and then write ar around different other ways that Shakespeare's dramaturgy investigates our experience of being in the world. So um, with Twelfth Night, I'm thinking of writing about, you know, space and being out of place. You know, Illyria is a place that's not here, it's somewhere else, and all of their characters are kind of out of place. And then um, uh, Richard III and, you know, his inauthentic relationship to other people, but the strange phenomenon that people just love this character. You know, he's just so fabulously wicked that we just yeah. love it. Um, and then, um, you know, the tempest and memory and recollection mm. and embodied recollection collection but remembering bodies I'm sort of sort of thinking about with that so that so that that's where I'd really love to to go to next for that yep so Thank just you. A, a small project then yeah. just small yeah. um but but again like 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 this stuff you sort of wade into these canonical areas of, of study and it's impossible to you know meet the expertise of all of those sort of mm. people in the area mm. so I think you know just that modesty of saying actually I'm just taking this element yeah. and this is what mm. I'm thinking about with mm. this text and there's so many other things that you could think about with yeah. relationship to that text mm. and uh, uh, there was there was something that I, I was going to say before which which I think is particularly I mean, maybe it's different with with what you're talking about, Lisa Marie, because we, when you're looking at a, a historical playwright, there's the time of the playwright, there's the historical period that they're writing about. So Henry V is several hundred years before, and then there's also the present context of performance. So mm -hmm. actually you've got these three different mm -hmm. temporalities which are laying over one another. And of course in production, you need to connect with the audience here now, otherwise it becomes a museum piece mm -hmm. or, um, or just completely irrelevant in mm -hmm. a modern context. So, and again, for me, that, yeah. that's the fascinating yeah. thing about yeah. getting back to the original yeah. question, our investigation of being, mm. I'm thinking about being here right now when I'm performing mm. because I'm taking something in the past and I'm having a conversation with people, people who are here and now. correct. Yeah, mm. yep. yep. it's the same. Yep. Same, same. Is that a good place to wrap up? Have we got, have we've got, yes, it is a good place. I'm noticing people are having to, to leave to sort of for whatever different reasons. So down. we've, um, the sun's going down. We've got, uh, even though we're on the other side of the solstice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The days are getting longer. They're going to get better. Um, thank you so much thank you. for this discussion and congratulations again on these two brilliant books. And I urge all of you out there to go and read them. They're, um, yeah, they're just, and they're just so well written. They're just really beautifully, really, and the reflections are just really beautiful and um, very easy, very accessible, and just so very kind to a reader. So, <laughs> And just a big thanks to Bridget and, you know, yeah. all the McCall people for, yeah. you know, getting the stuff ready for today, yeah. all of that. Mm, yeah, thanks. Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Andrew you. did it all. Thanks. And, and, Mike, and Mike. And, and, and Mike Faber, thank yeah. you for all of the technological support. And Tegan. Um, um, thank you. Okay. Yep. Yay. <laughs> thank you, Kate. <laughs> oh, thank you, Kate. Beautiful, beautiful.